right now we are uh, with the myth, the man, the legend, <laughs> Tim Vandelbaum. Hey. <laughs> hey Tim. Oh, a microphone? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. So let me show you the roastery. You uh, have never been here before, I guess. Yeah. This is a, it's a quite small roastery. We roast uh, 60, around 60 tons a year here. Uh, obviously, when we have subscriptions, we roast uh, two days only for that. And then we have another two days for our normal production. But in general, we roast two days a week. So um, everything is planned ahead. So we make uh, production plans. We measure the green coffee before we roast a certain day. So we roast on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Uh, all the bags for Wednesday roasts is labeled on Tuesday. All the batches are measured and weighed up in buckets on Tuesday. Uh, so that means when we start to produce on Wednesday, we have a plan. Everyone knows what to do. How many bags are going to be packed in 250 grams? How many kilo bags? Where the customers uh, or which customers are getting the coffee? So the production is extremely efficient. And we used to roast three days a week, uh, but that was in 2018. In 2018, we only roasted around 40 tons per year. Now we roast 60, around 60 tons, but only two days. So we have been uh, able to be much more efficient, mm -hmm. and mainly because the space is very small. So we don't have to move a lot. Mm -hmm. Everything is very close together. Um, so that's how I kind of designed the roastery. I don't want to, to walk a, a lot when I work because it's, many things can happen. So you just have to turn and you know, everything is in, within arm's reach. But let me show you the, the whole experience. We can start in the storage. So inside here is a little bit noisy, but uh, this is our temperature controlled storage. Um, but we don't store all our coffees here. This is coffee for maybe three weeks. Right now it's a little empty because we just finished roasting this week. But uh, you see most of our coffees come in, uh, in boxes. Uh, and inside the box you have uh, plastic bags where the coffees are vacuum packed. And the only country we don't do that is Ethiopia because they don't have the machines to do it yet. But we hope maybe in the future. So here we do Grain Pro. Um, you might see, now it's not a very good example, but maybe here. We have, uh, from every farm we buy from, we have many different lots. So for instance, the Caballero, who is visiting this week. Uh, this year we bought, uh, I think, 17 different lots. There are three lots of Katwai, we have three lots of Geisha, three lots of Pakamara, three different lots of uh, SL28, and a couple of lots of Batian. And also, like with Tamana, Finca Tamana, we, for instance, have um, two lots that is Varidad Colombia, the variety. But one lot is divided into two. So we have small screen size and big screen size. So like in Kenya, you have double A and AB. We do the same in Tamana. Uh, and that's just because there are quite a big difference between the size of the beans. And they roast more evenly if we, if we separate. With the Caballero, we don't do it like that. We buy screens 16 to 19. So it's a more narrow screen size. Um, so each uh, farm or producer sell us many different types of coffee in terms of varieties, so different flavors, but also different sizes and different pickings and everything. So if you go to our website, you might see that we sell Caballero Katawai the whole year. But within that year, it can be, you know, sometimes three different lots or it can be six or seven different lots. So there are small nuances in every one. Uh, we keep it here just for a couple of weeks and also the most expensive coffee we keep here just to have control of it. Um, but it's temperature controlled, not necessarily for uh, its uh, freshness because the way we produce coffee with the producers, it's dried very carefully, it's vacuum packed, uh, the coffees don't fade very fast. So we're not too concerned about that, but it's mainly that the coffee had the same temperature before we roast. So when we measure up the batches, they're all placed inside here and we only take out the uh, two buckets, which is one batch, right before we roast it. So it's always the same temperature at the starting point. And um, also a little bit because we want to keep it cool and stable when we store the coffee. 
So most of our coffee is stored uh, outside of Oslo in a rented warehouse. And in the winter, it's the warehouse is not isolated. So in the winter, it's actually a freezing storage because it's below zero in Oslo. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the summer, it's quite cool as well. So yeah. we find the quality is pretty good. Yeah. It's a bit messy here today because we uh, had a lot of production this week. So they didn't have time to clean, but that's the way it is. And these are the buckets we use. Cool, so uh, this is the roaster we use. A lot of coffee people know that. It's a Loring uh, 35 kilo roaster. We bought it in 2017, uh, but installed it in 2018. So we, because the building was delayed with the process, we had it in storage for a year. So we had to update a lot <laughs> when, when we installed it. But uh, it's basically um, a 35 kilo roaster and we sometimes roast 35 kilos, but uh, normally we do 30 kilo batches. And that's just because then we have a little bit extra power if we need it. Um, and also it kind of fits better with our logistics. So only 30 kilo batches. The only coffee we don't do 30 kilo is Geisha. We do 25. And that's just because the demand for it is a little bit lower than the other ones. But uh, maybe next year we'll have to do 30 kilos on that as well because the interest in geisha is growing so um yeah and uh, we use cropster so um uh, we connect it it's not on now but we connect uh, everything to cropster of course which logs the temperatures in the roaster and also the gas settings um, and we have three people roasting um, on a regular basis i can also roast and ben can also roast but we don't do it <laughs> so um we, our philosophy is that we have to create uh, routines uh, that are easy to follow and that are very consistent and also uh, recipes that are easy to follow and consistent. Uh, so I'm doing quality control in a, every Monday and I can't tell which person has been roasting. I mean, it's impossible to say. And the coffees are very consistent regardless of person. So for instance, an example is a lot of times when people roast, they mark the first crack because you can hear the first crack. This roaster is quite noisy, so you can't really hear it. And also, uh, it's a human element that will be different from person to person. Because do you mark first crack when you hear one bean cracking or three beans cracking? Or So instead of relying on this, we just say 200 degrees Celsius is where we mark the first crack. And normally most beans on this roaster uh, will crack around 198 to 201 degrees. So we say 200, first crack, and then we have development time after that. And that's one way of being very consistent. Because I'm not really interested in when it's cracking, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> uh, I'm more interested in total time. Of course, development time has something to do, but for us also, color measurement is extremely important. Uh, so we use this color track, which is basically a laser analyzer. So after each batch is roasted, we take a sample, we grind it uh, quite fine, and we analyze the color 200,000 times, and you get an average. And everyone can do that, that's fine. But the key, I think, is for consistent quality, is to have a very small window of uh, what you accept. Mm -hmm. So for instance, uh, on, the, on the Tatmara coffee, for instance, we roast to a color track value of uh, 47 to 48 so that's basically one <laughs> interval um, and uh, the tolerance of the machine is one so it's kind of but it's very precise if the coffee is on 46 it would be too light for us and probably for most people if it was on 49 most people will probably not notice but for us it will have a little bit more roastiness so then we don't pack it as our branded coffee we pack it in transparent bags and write this is not to our standard and we sell it a little bit cheaper so this is one of the most valuable tools we have it's uh, our main quality control as well as the logging and we check the weight and everything so if the coffee passes our standard uh, i mean anyone can use this as i say but if you have a big standard it doesn't really help uh, because uh, your quality will be inconsistent so you have to kind of find a uh, a standard that you're comfortable with, uh, with within that standard so not everyone wants to you know be as consistent and that's fine but uh, for us consistency is what we're known for and what we want to be 
So once the coffee is uh, kind of uh, approved by the roaster, uh, we send it into this lift. So we just basically pour the coffee in here. The coffee is uh, lifted by suction up here. And uh, there's a little uh, vibrator in here that vibrates. So the beans will fall down. You can't really see it very well, but inside here, there's a lot of uh, kind of slides. So the beans will fall down one by one. And there's a camera on both sides and, uh, and LED lighting and ultraviolet lighting analyzing the color of the beans. So it removes the light beans, light beans like Quakers. And also if maybe there's a bean that was stuck in the roaster and it was roasted twice, so it's black. <laughs> so this machine removes that. And maybe if there's any foreign material, it will take it away. And it does it by just blowing air. So um, this is, at least for me, really nice because most of our coffees are very high quality, but still you find Quakers. And if you have a Quaker, if you make an AeroPress and there's a Quaker, mm -hmm. uh, the coffee will taste like peanuts. Yeah. We don't like it. <laughs> so a lot of baristas remove it, but uh, for me it's better if we just remove it by machine. And I also like the natural process because they don't use water to float the coffees. You have a little bit more Quakers. So it just becomes a lot cleaner. You don't have this peanut flavor in the coffee. But there's also a lot of loss. So uh, the Quakers come out here. And of course, we don't remove only Quakers. There might be some good coffee as well. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, we actually repass it uh, one more time, uh, the coffee that comes out here. And then we pack the kind of good coffee from that and sell it cheap. And uh, the Quakers are, we throw it away or we give uh, coffee to this company that grows uh, mushrooms. Yeah. And then the good coffee that is not Quakers goes into this lift. Uh, so it's basically the same as on the other side. And then it's sent in this pipe over to our uh, weigh machine uh, that weighs out 250 gram bags or one kilo bags here. So one person is sitting here, just putting bags here and uh, filling the bags. And then the bags go to the counter or into a crate. And then we seal it with nitrogen um, uh, immediately. Uh, and it's really important to use nitrogen gas or CO2 gas or some kind of inert gas. Um, because the coffee will oxidize, even if you seal the bags. So very often I get coffee given to me by you know coffee friends uh, that are not flushed with nitrogen and after a week you can taste oxidation very very fast but it's it's a flavor that um, a lot of people don't uh, recognize because they're very used to it so i kind of say that it's almost like oaked wine if you're used to drinking oaked wine you don't really notice but if you drink a lot of unoaked wine and then all of a sudden get an oaked wine you're like wow what is this or it's like working in a barn with animals, you know, in the first five minutes you smell it and after that you, you're used to it. So it's kind of an attribute that is quite common in coffee, I think, and a lot of people don't notice, but I'm not so used to it because we drink, you know, fresh coffee all the time. Um, so I really don't like that flavor. So that's why we flush the bags because it really helps the coffee to stay fresh. And I know people freeze coffee and keep coffee for a long time and that's kind of okay but uh, in my opinion the coffee always tastes better when it's like stored properly in a flush bag for maybe three four or five weeks maximum that's when it's at its best in my opinion but uh, people have different opinions yeah so when it's packed we uh, put them in crates uh, we count all the bags of course so we, we try to have like many control points so that we know we're not doing mistakes. So for instance, uh, because we have pre-labeled bags, we know exactly uh, the amount of bags we have labeled. And if you all of a sudden end up with 30 bags empty, there's something wrong. So maybe the coffee was stuck somewhere or, you know. So um, it's very easy to spot mistakes uh, in this roastery because we have uh, all these kind of control points and because we are very well prepared in advance. Um, and then sometimes mistakes happen. So for instance, a classic mistake is like um, 
in January, the first roast day, people uh, make the labels and they put the roasting date on and they forget to change the year. So then it looks like it's one year old uh, coffee that's coming out of the roastery. And then of course you don't discover this until the end of the day. So then you have to start relabeling re all the bags and everything. So, you know, we do make mistakes like everyone else, but uh, we try to find them before they, the coffee is sent out. But yeah, so that's the roastery. And um, it is very small, but um, one good thing about being small is that you get much more organized. So you cannot have a lot of mess because it's impossible to work in a messy environment. Um, and also you find very smart solutions uh, and you use the space. Obviously rent is expensive, so have a big space would be nice, but uh, it's very expensive. And also very often when I see big roasteries that have a lot of space, you just store a lot of junk <laughs> that you don't need. So we try to just remove everything unnecessary in our workspace. So we only have what do we exactly need for, for production? Yeah. Any questions? <laughs> Maybe in the comments. Yeah. <laughs> then we'll have to do that. But um, yeah, that's it. Our little humble roastery. We've Thank been here, so I think, for, no, since 2018, so five years. Yeah. Uh, and uh, hopefully we can stay here another five years. But because uh, moving is a big uh, headache always. I have one question. Yeah. Uh, you changed the loading with Probat UG15. Yeah. Uh, what is the taste differences between? Um, I would say not. There's not a huge difference in taste. If if you have a good roast on both, uh, the taste is the same. I mean, more or less. Uh, but it's because we were roasting in a in our store. Um, the old UG15 is drawing a lot of air into the system from outside. So obviously in the winter when people open the door in our store <laughs> and it's mm -hmm. minus 20 degrees, the roaster gets really cold air in. And uh, so it was very difficult to be consistent. Uh, we managed to do it pretty well, but there was always small nuances and we had to change the recipe for the coffee every week. Um, but with the Loring, it's a closed system. Uh, so it's much more easy to be consistent. And also it's a hot air roaster. So even if you roast a little bit too light or maybe the coffee is slightly underdeveloped, it's still, because it's hot air roasting, it's in general more developed. So you don't taste, the coffee doesn't taste as grassy or as green as if we underdeveloped on the Probat. It would normally be extremely green in flavor. Uh, and also opposite, it could be also be a little bit more roasty if we had too much flame to compensate for the cold air being drawn in. So, um, but uh, if you roast well on both of them, you know, we couldn't tell the difference on a blind tasting. But it was very easy to switch because uh, we did testing maybe for a month. And after a month, we thought with blind cupping, we couldn't really tell the difference. Uh, and then we had roasted, you know, thousands of batches on the Probat. Uh, but you cannot use the same profiles like you have to roast faster uh, because it's a more efficient roaster. Uh, so I think a lot of a lot of times when people say that the Loring, for instance, the coffees are more roasty or not as clean, it's because they use uh, drum style roasting profiles on a hot air roaster and they, they, it's just too slow and uh, maybe also too dark. So um, uh, every machine I think you can use and roast great coffee. You just have to learn how to use that machine. It's kind of like, you know, buying a car. Yeah. <laughs> you can drive any car, you just have to learn. And um, some cars are faster, some cars are easier, some cars are harder, you know, but um, it's like with espresso machines as well, like what you put in is more important than the actual machine. So um, uh, yeah, learning how to be consistent on a machine, I think is the key. But we're super happy with the Loring and I was also very happy with the Probat, but uh, I would never go back now because this is a more modern uh, design and much easier to, to roast on. But the new Probat is probably much better than the one we had. We, we had a very old machine, uh, you know, th and I think the new ones are much, much better. So um, without having tested them, I, I just see in the design, they look much better. So, yeah. So thank you so much. No problem. <laughs> That's it. No more questions. I have no questions. <laughs>
<laughs> no. Great.